I quoted George Box's maxim earlier on with kind of a positive spin. But of course, there are lots of ways in which models can go wrong that are not helpful at all. A model fitted from data is only as good as the data, and only as good as the model, and only as good as the learning process, all of which may be subject to errors and uncertainty, both due to the random fluctuations of reality and also due to poor choices made along the way. So there are lots of ways in which machine learning can go wrong. It may be that the process that you're attempting to model is not well behaved. It may be that the data is not representative. It's possible that you've chosen poorly in your choice of model and the model that you've chosen is not able to capture the patterns in the data. It may be that the process that you're attempting to model is not a process at all and there are no patterns to capture. There are a couple of ways in which this can play out. It may be that the model will not come up with an answer at all. We call this failure to converge. This can be pretty annoying, especially if you've put a lot of time and effort into making the model, but you know, it's not the end of the world. Much more perniciously, the model may come up with a spurious answer that appears correct. It may be persuasive or even plausible. It might agree with what you expected to see. It's extremely important to be on guard against this, to be critical of your results and to be wary of confirmation bias. It's important to appreciate that machine learning really doesn't care about your problem. It doesn't even know about your problem. What it knows about is your loss function and your learning algorithm and your data. The loss function is a proxy for your problem, but it may not be a very good proxy. If there is some systematic way in which the learning algorithm can cheat to get the loss down, then it will definitely do so. If there's any pattern in the data that is not the pattern that you're looking for, but that succeeds in getting the loss down, then the machine learning algorithm will very likely do that. There are things that you can do to help mitigate this, which we'll discuss. But first and foremost, it's important to be aware of the problem and to be honest with yourself about it. You should check and triple check your results. You should be especially suspicious if you see what you wanted to see. If it looks too good to be true, maybe it is. You should always try to falsify your results. You should look for other sources of the results that you see. You should identify other causes and try to disprove them. So we've mentioned overfitting a couple of times already. Essentially, overfitting is tuning your model too closely to your training data to the point where it doesn't generalize to any other data. A model with sufficient capacity, like von Neumann's elephant, will eventually be able to fit the training data perfectly. You can sometimes, although not always, see this in your validation and test results. It's worth noting that the choices that you make as a result of validation results, for example, in model selection or hyperparameter tuning, are themselves a kind of fitting. The choices that you make will be affected by the validation data, and even though the learning algorithm never actually sees the validation data, the choices that you make can lead to overfitting as well. The term overfitting is sometimes used a little loosely to represent failures to generalize from other causes. A counterpart to overfitting is underfitting. This is when your model doesn't even manage to capture the behavior of the training data, much less generalize to new examples. This may be a result 
of lack of capacity in the model, or it may be that you have not given the model sufficient opportunities to learn, either because you haven't trained it for long enough or because you haven't given it enough data to learn from. Attempts to mitigate overfitting are known broadly as regularization. These almost always involve trading off some accuracy for behavior that is in some sense nicer. There are lots of different ways of doing this. Niceness isn't just a single thing, and we'll see quite a few examples in the coming weeks. When it comes to unhelpful machine learning terminology, the word bias is perhaps one of the most unrepentant serial offenders. It means a large number of different things in very context-dependent ways, almost none of which are exactly the thing that most people would first think of when hearing the word. There is a logic to all of these usages, but they are often slightly unintuitive. Perhaps the least intuitive of all is used to characterise patterns of misfitting across different types of model. This is known as the bias variance trade-off. In this context, bias is the tendency of a model to misfit due to the model structure or assumptions. Conversely, variance is the tendency of the model to misfit because it's too sensitive to the specifics of the training data. A high bias model will tend to converge to broadly similar but perhaps systematically wrong answers across a lot of different variations in the training data. It imposes stronger assumptions and may be prone to underfitting. A high variance model may converge to wildly different answers as a result of relatively small variations in the training data. But on average, all of those answers may be slightly closer to the correct answer. High variance models generally impose fewer assumptions and may be prone to overfitting. Ideally, we'd like bias and variance to both be low, but usually that's not the case, which is where the trade-off comes from. Regularization often involves trading a somewhat higher bias for a lower variance. Mostly when people talk about bias in real life, they mean nothing like that. What they mean is being treated unfairly or prejudiced against. They mean there is some kind of systematic skew against them, uh, or indeed for them, although people tend not to complain about that quite so much. This kind of bias is also rife in machine learning. The most common and obvious cause, although not the only one, is biased training data. That is to say, the training data is in some way not representative of the true data distribution. The model will learn some aspects of this misrepresentation and then transfer that to future cases that it deals with. As a relatively uncontentious example, consider the dog and cat pictures that we looked at earlier. In these, there was a mixture of colour and black and white, and that was distributed evenly across the two classes. If we changed the data like this, then suddenly we would have biased training data. And a model could easily learn that cats were things that were in black and white, while dogs are things that are in colour. There are plenty of examples in machine learning history, although some of them are probably apocryphal, of models learning the wrong thing because there were cues in the training data that the modelers didn't notice and take into account. So is that a plane or does it just have a blue sky background? Is that a horse or does it just have a green paddock? 
background. Is that a Russian tank or was the photo just taken on a sunny day or according to other versions of the story, a cloudy day or by a low resolution satellite image or was the film overexposed? There are lots of different versions of this story. It's one of the ones that's probably apocryphal. In examples from the analysis of images of faces, is mine the face of a natural born criminal or is it just that you're using a government issued ID to identify me? Do my cheekbones give away my sexuality or is it just the quality of lighting in my selfie? Am I hot or am I white? Optimistically, most people don't set out to collect racist training data or build a sexist model. But they do it anyway for two reasons. First of all, there's a lot of racism and sexism out there. There's a lot of structural inequality which inevitably percolates its way into the data that we use and that will show up in our training data if we're not careful. And secondly, they're not careful. Now, you might say that you're not interested in changing the world with your model and there are certainly interesting philosophical arguments to be had about the differences between descriptive and prescriptive data collection. But if you aren't at least aware of the inherent biases in your data, there is a good chance that they will come up and bite you in unexpected ways. Because they learn their behaviour from the data, rather than ever having it set out as a series of explicit instructions, machine learning models can sometimes be hard to interpret or explain. This isn't always the case. Some simpler models like uh, linear models and also decision trees may well be interpretable, but certainly a lot of the more complex models like deep neural networks are very difficult or impossible to fully understand or interpret. One of the things that this means is that they can lack explanatory power. Now this may not matter. It may well be that just empirically working is enough, but sometimes we would like to be able to understand something about the processes that we are modeling. Another issue with the black box nature of many machine learning models is that it makes them very difficult to verify. How do we know that they're going to do the right thing, especially when encountering data that is outside the training distribution? And how can we tell what kinds of vulnerabilities they may have? We've already seen cases where models don't do the right thing because the training data poorly represented the population that was encountered at test time. It turns out that if you probe the decision processes of complex machine learning models in detail, there will often, perhaps always, be very fine-grained vulnerabilities to data that falls outside of the training distribution and the model assumptions. These vulnerabilities can be exploited by carefully crafted pieces of data known as adversarial examples. The surprising thing is how very subtle these vulnerabilities can be. Tweaks to the input that are completely imperceptible to a human observer may be able to derail the model performance completely. Here are some examples from the original paper that identified this problem. Six images on the left were all correctly classified as a school bus or a praying mantis or an adorable puppy by the AlexNet model that was used in the paper, whereas the six on the right, which are almost indistinguishable in the original form and probably completely indistinguishable when compressed in a video, are all classified instead as ostriches. Adversarial examples don't have to be subtle or imperceptible to humans. Many people have experimented with what are known as adversarial patches, which are images that you can put on objects in real life, and they will transform the ability of a model to classify them. In the example here, the researchers have printed out this rather large patch worn by the person on the right, and that is enough to stop a person identifying model from being able to spot him as a person, whereas it worked perfectly well with the person 
next to him who isn't wearing the patch. In one more kind of entertaining example, this uh, turtle is a model that was 3D printed, generated by researchers at Google, which fools an image classifier into thinking it's a rifle from nearly any angle. Adversarial examples are interesting for a whole range of reasons, but one of those is to call into question our interpretation of what the models are doing. Once again, I would just emphasise that we shouldn't think of models as understanding the task at hand, but rather deploying a range of tricks that will enable them to perform the task, and those tricks may have vulnerabilities. We will often use low-dimensional examples in lectures and also in lab exercises because they are easy to visualise and easy to understand. They often have an intuitive interpretation. Humans have direct experience of just three spatial dimensions and tend to be quite bad, or really, really bad indeed, at visualising or in any kind of visceral way understanding what's going on in very high dimensional spaces. But machine learning problems that we encounter in real life are often extremely high dimensional. A machine learning problem of 10 or 100 dimensions is really a low dimensional problem. Very standard basic data sets used in image processing and computer vision have 784 dimensions. Front facing phone cameras from a decade ago had a resolution of about 1280 by 960 pixels. That would make a conservative, if naive, estimate of the dimensionality of the space of selfies about three and a half million dimensions. This is a problem partly because it's bewildering and partly because it requires a lot of computational power to process that kind of data. But it's also a problem because it turns out that in some important ways, high dimensional spaces are not very like low dimensional ones and our innate intuitive understanding of low dimensional spaces may be somewhat misleading when transferred to these high dimensional ones. Trivially, high dimensional spaces are just much bigger than low dimensional ones. If you consider a d-dimensional hypercube, then all of the opposite faces are just one unit apart, but the opposite corners are the square root of d apart. And so the available distance increases without bound as the dimension goes up. This also means that hypervolumes are very unevenly distributed with the distance. If you imagine a hypersphere embedded inside our unit hypercube, its radius will be a half. It touches all of the faces of the hypercube, but its hypervolume uh, goes proportional to uh, half to the power of d. So it actually tends to zero as a fraction of the hypercube's face. Almost all of the volume is concentrated in the corners and more generally far away. If you take uh, an ordinary square or a cube and you make it very slightly bigger, then almost all of the area or the volume uh, remains what was in the original square or cube. This is not the case when dealing with hyper objects in very high dimensional spaces. If you make the object very slightly bigger, then the amount of hyper volume that's concentrated in that shell that you've just added massively dominates all the rest. Nearly all of the high dimensional space is concentrated in a thin shell at the maximum distance away from you. If you randomly sample points from across such a space, then those randomly sampled points will also be concentrated in that outermost shell, and they will all wind up being more or less the same distance apart from each other. This can make distance metrics less useful and less discriminative in high dimensional spaces. The good news is that we tend not to be particularly interested in randomly sampled points from across a high dimensional space. Consider the three and a half dimensional selfie space mentioned earlier. To a pretty good approximation, nearly all of the points in that space 
like this. They're packed with information, but to human eyes, they're completely uninteresting and they'll all be pretty much interchangeable. Images that we are interested in have much more structure and they tend to have very many fewer degrees of freedom. They can be said to occupy a low dimensional manifold within the high dimensional space. This is often the case for data that humans are interested in. Human problems tend to be relatively low dimensional. They tend to occupy these lower dimensional manifolds with fewer degrees of freedom than our naive representations would make it seem. This is because they have some semantic or causal structure that holds them together, and largely this is what allows our brains to interpret them as well. So the problem of distance metrics becoming less meaningful in high dimensional spaces isn't quite as catastrophic as it might at first appear. It's not negligible though, because there will always be some random fluctuations, and also because even these low dimensional manifolds in the high dimensional spaces will often be pretty high compared to our everyday experience of the 3D world.